a little bit throughout the year. Okay, I think we've got another question. So, um, is it true that engineering at Oxford is far more theoretical and less practical than other universities? Um, any thoughts, Stephen? Um, I mean, yes, um, it is an engineering science degree. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean it's not practical. So there are huge practical elements as well. I think it depends a lot on what you want to study and what options you choose. So I'm kind of selecting my options on Friday for third year. So I spent a lot of time looking into those. And some of them are really theoretical and would almost be kind of a physics degree at some other universities. And then some of them are actually really, really practical and much, much more hands-on. So it's like, yes, it's probably a little bit more theoretical, but in first year, I got to build a bridge. And that was really great because it kind of combined all of the structures and all of the kind of physics -y side of it of planning how to build the bridge and then actually building the bridge, which I've heard is an absolute nightmare because you plan these millimeter precision cuts and then you screw it up and then your bridge collapses. And it's just like, oh, construction's really hard. Um, I can confirm that did happen to a lot of people. Um, and kind of what proportion of your time in first year do you think you spent doing practical things, Stephen? I mean, we have labs one day a week, so somewhere between 20% and a quarter is probably about right. Um, and I don't know what happens. Does it get more practical or more theoretical as you go up into fourth year? So it does really depend. Um, I took a practical, like an experimental fourth year project. Um, so my time was 50-50 for practical work and theoretical really. Um, but if it's not your thing, there's nothing to stop you choosing a like, purely coding project. Um, so you can just exist, you and your laptop for the, the rest of your life really. Okay, we've got another question. So which programming language will you learn in electrical and information engineering or other courses? Do I need to learn it before I enter the course? Um, so I assume it's still the same, Stephen, but um, the programming language I was taught from my first year and still use now um, is MATLAB. Um, and you absolutely don't need to learn it before you come to the course. They teach you MATLAB from the very, very basic. So essentially how to use it as a calculator right up into building your own functions and your own programs. Um, maybe you could give an example of the programming, um, like lab work that you did in your first year, Stephen? Yes. Yeah, so one of the big first year labs that is it's like a fifth of the labs or something is basically you learn MATLAB from this is what adding up numbers goes to all the way through to um, simulating a little rocket landing on Mars, which has its own kind of, there's a load of physics in there. So you've got a program in the physics and then you've got a program in the control systems actually working at how it works. And there are about 12 functions and I didn't understand much of it. And um, yeah, you kind of get handheld through that quite a lot and really just build up the basics of MATLAB. Um, in terms of specifically electrical information engineering, there in terms of hardware description languages, because this is what I'm going to specialize in next year, we do something called Verilog. Do not learn Verilog. It's a nightmare, but just kind of going to tell you that's the one we use. Um, and overall, I don't think you need to learn any specific programming language. If you get bored over the summer and want to do something, pick any programming language and just look at it. It doesn't need to be MATLAB. It doesn't need to be R or Python or anything else. Just pick something cool because so much of the skills translate and whatever programming language you like the look of, if you're just vaguely familiar with how programming languages work, that does make the first couple of weeks of the MATLAB a little bit easier. Yeah, definitely. Um, and even though it is MATLAB that you'll learn, I would always suggest not going for MATLAB just because it's harder to get hold of um, as someone who doesn't have a license. So maybe go for something more open source like Python. Okay, and then we've got, how did you prepare for the PAP? Um, so this is the physics admission test for anyone that's not sure. Um, and you sit it before you come to interview. Um, personally, I started by having a look at the syllabus um, because then, especially depending on whether you took A-levels or something or an international qualification, um, you might not, not necessarily have covered everything that is in the PAP syllabus. Um, and it's worth knowing what you need to know and what you don't need to know. So start by having a look at the syllabus, which is available online. Um, and then I found that past paper questions for the PAP were by far and away the most useful way to prepare. Uh, you might look at them to start with and be like, what on earth? Um, some of these are a bit funky, um, but you'll get used to the style pretty quickly. Um, and I think if you if you run out of past papers to do, although it's very, very fine if you don't, um, some kind of UK physics challenge papers are also quite useful. Um, anything else, Stephen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are 18 weeks until the PAT and there are 16 years of past papers available. Um, <laughs> I think other things you can use are the Cambridge assessment. It's called the ENGA, E-N-G-A-A. -A. It's not quite the same, but it's vaguely similar and it's got a similar vibe because they are similar courses with similar vibes. And then also British Physics Olympiad or what's it called? 
the, the, the one below that, the UK Physics Challenge, whatever it's called nowadays, has a similar vibe of question. The really cool thing about the pack, but that also makes it really hard, is a lot of the time you're taking bits from your physics and you're taking bits from your maths and you're mushing them together. So you'll take a curve from the materials bit where you've got the Hooke's law and then the curvy bit and then the breaking point at the end. And you'll have to work out the work done as you're stretching this component. But in order to work that out, you'll need to do the integral. And that's something that can't exist by definition A level and doesn't exist in most, if not all, of the similar qualifications. Because you've got your physics bit and you've got your maths bit and they're not allowed to talk to each other because not everyone's doing both. The thing about the PAT is 99% of people doing the PAT are doing both and the people who aren't are working their socks off to catch up. Um, so you've got that kind of really interesting taking physics and applying maths to it, which is really what first year is about. Um, to kind of swiftly swing into the next question, we've got what characteristics of prospective engineering students do admissions staff seek to look for? Um, so I'm going to preface all of this by saying I'm a second year and I don't know what I'm talking about. So this is my experience of the admissions process, my experience of the interview and my gut feeling. This might all be baloney. Um, but the way I see it, is they're obviously looking that you've got an aptitude for engineering. You need to have some sort of skill in maths and physics. That's what the path is for. They want to see that you want to study engineering, probably through a personal statement, probably a little bit through the interview. If you don't want to study engineering, it's like, why? So something specific that's like, why engineering above English? And then also, why engineering above physics? Why engineering above material science? They're both probably the two most similar courses at Oxford. They both come off the path, so you can see you've got a very similar skill set when you arrive. Why engineering specifically? And then beyond that, aptitude to learning. So I think it matters less. Like if you know kind of 5% less than another applicant, you learn so much at Oxford that almost doesn't matter when you arrive. What's important is your ability to learn, your ability to learn quickly in the interview, to feed off hints from the tutors kind of asking you the questions, to synthesize the information, to work out what's going on. And I've no idea how to prepare for that. So this isn't going to end with a really resounding answer, but that's kind of some of the things I think they're looking for in some order. Do you have anything to add to that, Rosie? Uh, no, not hugely, other than maybe these people are going to have to teach you in the end. So um, some kind of suitability for the, the style of tutorial. So if, if you, you're so phased by everything that you just said that in silence for the whole of your interview, um, that probably means that tutorials aren't for you. So just talk to them. Um, and everyone can talk, you'll be fine. <laughs> um, okay, do I need to choose which type of engineering I want to specialize in before joining first year, or does that come later? Uh, no, you absolutely don't need to choose what you're going to specialize in. Um, some people, I think, choose to. I believe there's an option on um, the UCAS form to, to like, choose an option, but um, there was for me anyway. Um, it doesn't mean anything. Um, everyone does the same course for the first two years, um, other than lab work. Um, and those people who think that they know what they want to specialise in often don't anyway. Um, I know many, many people who arrived thinking they were going to be obsessed with bridges um, and now do something entirely different. Um, so I think I wanted to do mechanical engineering, um, like quite like cars and planes. Um, and I've done a bit of that, um, but I'm now off to do a PhD in biomedical engineering. So if you think you know, you probably don't anyway. Um, anything to add, Stephen? Yeah, so you don't choose options you have a little bit in the middle of second year to choose some coursework modules but really your first proper options are at the end of second year i'm choosing mine on friday i think the deadline's next week um and i think it's been really helpful to stay general because i'm still not 100 percent sure which set of options i'm going to go for i've got three written down i'm definitely going to do electrical in some capacity but i'm kind of going do i want civil do i want a bit of bio i'm not sure what i'm going to do and i finished my second year and ostensibly know how all this works so yeah i'm just going to really echo whatever you think you enjoy you might do but at the same time there's such a breadth to engineering that i didn't see at school like i didn't really know bio existed and i kind of went yes biology is easy and then i got here and was like oh no it's not it's it's really evil um i don't know what you know about the e eem stuff rosie we've got a question that's about the opportunities to study abroad in industry and if so do you know any of your year who have gone off and done that sort of thing um so in terms of studying in industry we don't have a set course. I know other places might do like a year in industry or a year abroad. That's less of a thing at Oxford. Although some years there have been an option for four years to go and spend their last year. I think it's at Princeton. Um, there's an exchange there, um, but it's definitely not not a guarantee. If if you've got your heart set on a year abroad, this course probably isn't for you. Um, but in terms of working in industry, there are definitely options. So lots of fourth year projects have a link to industry. 
um, also some of the coursework modules. So my in my second year, I did a coursework module um, for a week. It was like an intro to Formula One. Um, and we had lots of involvement with Williams F1 and that. So we went twice to the conference center, which is quite near to Oxford. And we did some like aerodynamic design challenges for them and got to present to, to their like chiefs of aerodynamics. So um, definitely links with industry and lots of kind of employers will come in and give us talks. I think there's like an engineering, engineering and industry talk once a week in first year that you can go to and you get to hear about some pretty cool stuff through that. Um, so yeah, definitely don't worry about not being involved in industry, but equally industry work tends to be reserved for internships rather than whole years spent for the specific company. Um, oh, in terms of where students have gone in the past, literally everywhere, like Oxford will send engineers to the top civil defence um, firms, also to other universities, um, into teaching, lots of finance, consultancy, if, if you can like name it, an engineer will have done it. Um, okay, what kind of questions are asked at interview for engineering? Um, Stephen, if you can remember roughly what or what type of thing uh, they were? I mean, I only got two interviews. They're all vaguely similar, but at the same time, they will change college and college year <laughs> on year. They will have shifted a little bit in the, what will have been three years since the main Two years, I can't do maths. Um, broadly, math questions, math and physics. Um, it is, there is not as much of the kind of, why do you want to study engineering as I think people expect. And a lot of the time, that kind of question about your personal statement is not actually massively relevant. It's just used to kind of ease you into the interview, to get you talking, to get you comfortable. Um, one of the reasons for this is because those questions are quite easy to prepare for. Um, it's relatively doable just to sit down and go, I'm going to write a spiel about why I was inspired to do engineering from the age of six. And that's not what they're looking for in an interview. What they're looking for is the aptitude to do well on an Oxford engineering course. The way they do that is by throwing questions at you that are kind of from bits of the first year-ish on the Oxford engineering course. Um, so there was a lot of graph plotting. Um, as I mentioned, it's from the PAP. It comes back in interview. Something that came up a few times, I'm not going to name any specific questions, but that came up a few times in my interviews was them giving me kind of physics-y questions where I was looking at free body diagrams. I was looking at kind of how objects are moving. I was looking at forces. And then out of nowhere, I would get hit by some calculus. And it's just like, oh, there's calculus here. And that's kind of what they're looking for. They're looking for you to have that aptitude to look at the real world and to realize that all of those tips and tricks you've done in maths, maybe further math, maybe not, actually are critically relevant to so many engineering problems. And they're not really two separate subjects because that's what engineering does. It kind of just brings them together. Rosie, how did you prepare for the interview? Um, so I think A, to start with the path is, is quite good preparation for the interview in and of itself. Um, but after that, I had to look at, I think it's called, I want to study engineering. I mean, you've probably used it more, more recently than me, um, but it's full of interview style questions. Um, so I think I remember doing quite a fun one about um, like the vibrations of air inside like a clarinet or something and why like warm air um, would lead to clarinets being like flatter or sharper. Um, and then it, it was set up for you. I know you're putting a face, Stephen, but it was easier than it sounds. Um, but it was that kind of application to of kind of new problem that I think is really good preparation for interview. I also think as you go through your like physics A level or you, your PAP preparation, when you finish your question, take a step back um, and think about whether the, the answer you've got is likely, um, because that's something that my tutors really like um, emphasized in tutors. So you might have made an assumption early on, or they might have even told you you've made the assumption. When you get to the answer, you look at it and you're like, actually, I don't think that's how that's going to move or maybe you've made a mistake and you look at the unit and you're like, I know those units aren't the units of pressure. And I think being able to spot those mistakes in your work or even the mistakes in the assumption um, are really important techniques to carry into your degree and the type of thing they'll be looking for in interviews. Okay, we've got, do you need to have further maths for this course? Will I be at a disadvantage if I haven't done it? Um, so I have further maths. I believe you don't need it, but Stephen, is that still the case? So, um, further maths, I think, is in the recommended bucket. Um, someone can, will shout at me in the chat if that's wrong. Where it's like, it's nice, you don't need it, um, but it is nice. Um, I think in terms of the application process, so kind of before the course, further math, not having further maths won't get in your way on the UCAS form much. Like, we're just looking for grades, you're looking for aptitude. Further maths is nice. I think you get like two A stars in maths, further maths or physics. So it's like further maths just gives you an extra option to get there, but you can do it with maths and physics. 
And I think at interview, it doesn't actually matter a huge amount because they're looking to test you at the limits of your ability. So my one of the questions I got in interview was about electronics. I have electronics available. So that question very, very quickly went beyond the physics electronics and went very rogue because they wanted to see how much I knew. And then they, wa they watched me struggle and was just like, OK, what do you actually know? How are you capable of learning new things? Can you synthesize this information? Can you take it on and work out what's going on? Um, I imagine similar things will happen if you've got chemistry and if you've got further maths or not. Um, the only time in terms of the application process where not having further maths will put you at a slight disadvantage is in preparing for the PAT. Because the PAT has its own syllabus, and while it's similar to the A-levels, the IBs, the APs, whatever, um, Scottish Hires, whatever courses you're studying, there'll be things you haven't done. If you're doing further maths, I reckon you'll have 95% of the PAT syllabus under your belt, depending on exactly what your school's done. If you've not got further maths, it might be 80%, so you'll have a little bit more work to do over the summer just to prepare for that. But beyond that, there's not a big disadvantage in um, not having further maths. Having something that's relevant to engineering is nice, but again, it's not required. Like if, if it's not further maths, chemistry is nice, but if it's music, still apply, still give it a go. And if you have the mathematical aptitude, that's what the test is for. When you get to Oxford in first year, because I'm actually the only one at my college, I think in my year who has further maths, when you get to Oxford in first year, if you don't have further maths, your first two weeks are quite brutal. Like that's probably the point where you're at the biggest disadvantage relative to everyone else is they basically teach all the further maths in a week. And if you've got further maths, then it's actually quite a nice introduction. Like it's relatively gentle. The tutorial sheet's nice. You've seen half of it before and it's okay. It's, it's a good introduction. If you've not got further maths, then it's, a, then it's kind of brutal. And it's kind of right. You, you are smart enough to learn this because you're at Oxford and everyone I knew was like they could do it but at the same time they did kind of work a 50 60 hour week just to kind of get themselves up to speed and the same is true with the prep work so in terms of the application doesn't really disadvantage you much in terms of the summer before you go to uni you've probably got a bit of extra work just to kind of catch yourself up but at the same time it's not a big deal uh, do you want to add to that Rosie uh, no I think that pretty much covers everything um, we've also got how long does the interview take um, so you normally have two at different colleges um, and they're around 20, 25 minutes. Um, that can vary a bit. Um, for example, if you know lots about a particular subject area and they need to like push you to make sure that they've asked you something you don't know. Um, but I think I don't know many people who've interviews for longer than 25 minutes. So, and at least when I have my interviews, they both happened on the same day. Um, so unlike other subjects, I didn't have to stay overnight, which really takes some of the, the stress out of the experience, I think. Um, okay, we've got how important is the college choice for engineering? Thoughts, Stephen? Um, for the engineering bit of engineering, pretty much irrelevant. Like you need to be going to a college that offers engineering, but beyond that, anywhere you want. Um, I am at St. Anne's because we are right next to University Parks, which means I will get up and do exercise because if I'm any further away from that, I will not. And because I can get up at five to nine and be on time for a 9 a.m. lecture because we're right next to the department as well. Um, so yeah, for the, from the engineering side of things, basically irrelevant. For the Oxford side of things, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Why, why did you choose UNIF, Rosie? Um, it had quite a big intake of engineers. Um, I wanted to make friends. Um, but other than that, I think so UNIF normally does like a maths week before term starts, which like gets you up to speed with your maths. So if you haven't got further maths, I'd really recommend having a look because maybe that would be a way to um, make it a bit more chill. Um, but yeah, I like having that bit more time before term started to settle in and remind myself what maths for. Um, but yeah, other than that, it, I don't think it's hugely important. Everyone ends up happy, so don't stress about it. Okay, is your tutor coming from your college or is it distributed by the engineering department it may come from other colleges? So if I talk about my experience and then see, maybe you could talk about yours. Um, so I had three tutors in my first year, two who were at my college and the other one who my college, I think, employed. Um, so he teaches at Imperial, I think, um, and he would come in like once a week to teach us. Um, as I went through my degree, that changed a bit more. So I think in second year, we had a tutor that would tutor three or four colleges who would come because she would teach control theory, which none of my tutors specialise in. Um, and then from third year onwards, it's arranged by the department. So your tutors happen in the department normally, um, not with people from your college. Um, and they're, they're slightly bigger. There are normally like three or four of you. Um, Stephen, what was, what was your experience in the first couple of years like? Yeah, it, I think it's 
for the first couple of years at least, pretty much everything's arranged by the colleges. The colleges are technically responsible. You have a personal tutor who's technically the one who does it, and it's mostly internal. Occasionally, if um, you're in a college with a relatively small number of engineering students, or there's just a specific course, more so in second year, where none of the tutors have the in- have the I don't want to say have the intellect, you know what I mean, <laughs> have the have the academic grounding and the right bit of engineering because they're so specialised. Um, that they'll just kind of find someone else, whether it be a PhD student, someone from another college, someone else who can just kind of go, you know, control theory, go and teach them control theory. Um, but yeah, for the first two years, it's very much internal. Um, I think it's quite nice because I've had, oh, what will it have been? 50 tutes, probably, with the same tutor. Um, and that, no, no, I think I'll be at 50 when you add in revision tutes and everything else, which is an awful lot of time, especially because he will not go under an hour. And it means he knows how I work and I know how he tutors. So it's kind of not going to be the same for everyone. Having said that, don't try and choose your college based on which tutors you're going to get because they move around like nothing else. So if you kind of go, I want Professor Greg to give me tutorials in second year on control theory, then I guarantee you by Murphy's Law, by the time you get there, Professor Greg will have moved somewhere else. Um, so don't kind of try and set yourself up for anything that specific because they move around with some degree of regularity. Um, Rosie, do your lectures take place at college or in the building? And especially, I don't know what fourth year lectures do actually. Um, well, obviously this year my lectures were online, um, but normally fourth year lectures, um, like all lectures, take place in departments. Um, so there are two main lecture theatres and then one smaller one, mostly is how it works. So um, yeah, the lectures happen. Um, normally like either for two hours starting at 9am or two hours starting at 11am um, in the department um, and that's all of your year together. Um, okay what is your favourite part of the course and um, what is your least favourite Stephen? Um, my favourite part of the course is ooh, I reckon still control theory I'm a big fan of control theory so um Control theory is kind of a mix of electrical, electro, well, electronic engineering, and then just straight maths. Um, it's about trying to get things to stay either stable, or my favorite example is getting segways to stay upright. Um, so when you're on a segway, and the things you're going to lean forward, lean back, you are the control system. If you put a brick on a segway, the segway will fall over because it overbalances. Um, and so there's quite a lot of maths in there, but there's also a lot of the real world kind of you're using electrical components. They don't quite work how the maths expects them to. So you have to build in nuances and systems for that. Um, my least favorite part of the course is thermodynamics. And I am very happy. I'm never going to touch that again. Whereas I think I may be opposite here. Control theory is not my favorite thing. Um, other than the lab, which was really cool. It had like a quadcopter thing that you had to, to learn to fly. Um, but in general, I found it quite hard. Um, whereas thermodynamics, I really enjoyed. So that, for those of you who don't know, might be like your engines or um, you're like, okay, that sounds more boring than that, but like fridges is also thermodynamics. <laughs> There's a fridge lab. Um, and I ended up doing my project in, in the thermodynamics department. So I looked at um, like surface roughness inside engines and how that affected it. So yeah, I'm sorry to have been the opposite of you there, Stephen, but <laughs> I guess it's a bit different. Um, what career are you planning on going into? Any idea? Stephen? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a second year. Why don't you take this one? <laughs> I mean, I can. Um, so I'm off to do a PhD. Um, so I'm staying in like academia, I guess. Um, and I'm doing it in like heart mechanics. So looking at building hearts in computers and then making like matching them up with the real human hearts and seeing like what procedures have what effect, that kind of thing. Um, do you have, do you think you'll stay in electronics, Stephen? Or? I can almost guarantee I'm not going to do a PhD. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure where I'm going, but I am. Yeah, and in going more generally, I think that hits a lot of people when they get to Oxford or indeed any, like most of Oxford Engineering is going to have been near the top of their respective schools for five or seven years because that's the nature of Oxford. Um, you are going to be someone who's bright. You are probably used to doing quite well. I got to Oxford being very used to being quite well. I had some latent arrogance, immediately got smacked down within the week. I was just like, oh, I'm not that bright. And then you actually realise, no, you are because you're at Oxford and actually everyone kind of feels a bit impostery. Um, but in terms of longer term, probably going into outreach, outreach or tutoring or this sort of thing, because I just love jumping up and down and talking about things. I think it's very relatable, the like ego getting smashed as soon as you arrive. I think 
my teacher set us like a midterm test and I got two out of 15 and I was like oh no <laughs> I thought I was clever um but yeah it all works out um what about any books that you might recommend Stephen? There was one I recommended earlier, which is called Structures or Why Things Don't Fall Down. Um, so I never quite got into civil, but this is one of the things I was reading when I was kind of interested about it. I actually read this in first year, but I think it's kind of useful before then. It's about 20% fun book and 80% textbook. So it's not kind of a novel. It's not massively exciting all the way through but it introduces things it tells you a bit about kind of the background and then just kind of bashes you with some maths to let you know what you're getting in for and i think it's a really good way of both seeing the fun side of civil and then also actually how rigorous the maths is to make sure you're happy with both halves of it because that was what got me at civil it was like i loved it i loved looking at buildings i loved watching them collapse and they actually got hit by the maths and it was just like oh i'm not actually massively fond of this vector calculus i'm gonna go somewhere i don't have to do that do you have any favourite books, Rosie? Uh, I read, before I came, I think called The Science Prime Speed, which was the kind of design manual for the supersonic car, Bloodhound. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, um, but would really recommend. I thought that was excellent. Um, I've just seen the next question, which I do actually quite want to answer. So if we move on quickly. Uh, were you nervous when you first went into the lab? I would be scared I would break something. So all I'm going to say here is people do break things, and that's fine. Um, you obviously try not to, um, but in the same way, that if you broke something in food tech at school your teacher might be a bit like oh no but it's fine like don't worry about it I broke a very very expensive window this year um and my tutor was incredibly patient so if you broke something don't worry and definitely don't stress about going into labs um what happens if I'm unable to answer a few of the questions asked in the interview are we expected to answer every single question asked correctly Stephen I would argue that if you answer every single question you're asked in an interview correctly, the interview probably hasn't gone very well. Um, I think if you don't leave the interview feeling like your brain is mush and you've been pushed to your absolute limits, then the tutors probably won't be massively um, engaged. Like what they want is they want you struggling. They want you kind of right at the limits of your ability. So pretty much every interview I've had, whether this for Oxford or for a lot of other things, um, scholarships and all those sorts of things, your, your brain leaves feeling like mush and that's okay. Um, I think you're not expected to answer every single question correctly. One, they want to see how you learn and they want to see what happens when you get things wrong. So they'll make questions harder until you get them wrong. Um, and then two, they're really understanding of silly errors. So I got current and voltage backwards and just used the wrong words for a good five minutes in my interview. And my professor just didn't really care because he knew that I wasn't actually like that because he's he has no grades so especially the little arithmetic errors that you make when you're under pressure don't worry about them they've got your pat results they've got your grades they know you're bright they just want to see how you think and they appreciate your brain will go a bit mushy under all the pressure um, i can confirm i forgot where the origin on a graph was in my interview and they weren't at all fast um so, so don't worry she's something really stupid um what skills are beneficial for the courses um I think being able to be really flexible I like apply your knowledge in lots of different ways and um, so I think I said earlier on like the the Slido questions um, someone was asking about automotive engineering I was like yeah you can do that here like we did all of this math for suspension but did you know that we also used that math to analyze um, how nanoparticles can be used in drug delivery like the, the ability to apply the same techniques across the board right into the course um, is really really useful Um, obviously math and physics skills also excellent. Um, okay, final question, Stephen. What tips do you have for anyone thinking about applying to Oxford for engineering? I think the biggest tip I would have is just apply. Like, I think one of the biggest barriers to entry for Oxford engineering is that people don't apply and you lose nothing, okay? You lose a little bit of your time in October, but you're going to have to write your personal statement anyway. You're going to have to revise for your a-levels anyway quite frankly if you want good revision for A-levels learning to do the pat over the summer will mean your physics your maths and your further maths you're taking it are going to be top notch going into year 13 um, so it's probably just good for learning anyway and it costs you nothing the pat might be like six quid you're spending nine grand a year on the university it's not a big um, expenditure it might be yeah like five or six quid max so it doesn't quite cost you nothing but it costs you essentially nothing and it worth doing just for the experience if you get an interview unfortunately yours are i think confirmed to be online but don't quote me on that there's a very very slim chance they end up in person but i'm fairly sure they're on yeah they're all online um but yeah you, you lose nothing you might as well give it a go if you think you're kind of bright enough for it go for it if not 
you might be proven wrong. You might get, I didn't think I was going to get in. I was like, oh, that admissions test actually went really well. And I showed up for the interview thinking, yeah, I'm not getting in. It's going to be good. It's in person. I get to, st- I get to be at Anne's for a day. It'll be fun. <laughs> and then somehow they let me in and I'm still here. So might as well give it a go. Um, do you have any tips, Rosie? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it. Just leave yourself enough time. Um, you know you've got to sit the path, so don't look at the syllabus three days before and then have a panic. Just give yourself a few weeks. Um, it should be fine. Um, so we do, need, do you want to mention the Q&A quickly? Yes, yeah, so at 2 p.m. today, so in an hour and a half, there is a tutor live stream where you can talk to someone who knows far more than I do about engineering. Um, and they'll probably speak a little bit more, I suspect, about the tutorial process. If you've got questions about that and how the teaching works, that's a really good place. If you have questions about the interviews and the admissions process, you can try, but they will probably be more cagey than we are. Um, tomorrow, we do that same thing again. So if any of your friends haven't been able to make it today, do point them at us tomorrow. And there is an admissions newsletter on the Virtual Open Day website, which will send you really good links and reminders to say, hey, you need to remember to sign up for the PAT, because there are always a couple of people every year who forget to do that, Um, and just the boring stuff like that. I think that is all we've got time for. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope hope it's been good. I've basically been speaking into the void for the last half hour. I have no idea how many people are watching. I have no idea if this has been good. I hope someone watched, Um, you know. (laughs) 